We are here inside of Right Choice Happenings podcast room with Blake Landry, the research manager within the economic department at Niagara Region. How much did I butcher that? Thanks, Joe. Pretty close. Uh, manager of economic research and analysis with Niagara Region Economic Development. Perfect. And thank you so much for joining me here. I really appreciate it. Um, it's our first time that going to have a conversation at this length. Talking, about, We're going to talk about economics within Niagara and maybe some trends, some things going on. I'm really looking forward to this because even though I work in real estate within Niagara, you know a lot of things that's going on that I have no idea. And so I'm looking forward to this. But yeah, thank you. I gave you a little tour of the office just now down here and now we can start. So um, how long have you been working at the region and within the development, economic development department? Um, well, um, this month, actually, I've been there for seven years now, but mm. this is actually the second time I've worked at the region in the economic development. I worked there from 2008 to 2011. Then I left. I was in the private sector for six years, and then I, so I've been at the region for seven years now, mm. um, doing the economic data research, uh, um, that sort of thing in the division. Gotcha. Sounds good. And what is it that... The department does what are you guys all about over there so um, Niagara economic development we're responsible for marketing Niagara for new business for investment um, so we're out there internationally um, promoting the region as a good place to do business um, we're also responsible for um, things like grants and incentives for industrial development mm. we're responsible for uh, research and analysis on the economy um, strategic regional initiatives. So oftentimes there's like big projects regionally that are important. For instance, one of them would be like the Canada Summer Games 2022. So we mm -hmm. were involved in that. Um, uh, but predominantly the marketing, investment attraction, and then facilitating those investments uh, from the regional level, as well as working with the local municipalities to make that stuff happen. Sounds like there's big stuff going on over there. <laughs> like, so when marketing uh, businesses to come to Niagara, what are some of the benefits? What are we, what can we use to attract them to come here? So that's a great question. Historically, it was always about cost of living. You know, we were always <laughs> more affordable than other regions and right. let's say Southern Ontario. But now um, things are leveling out, but we're still highly competitive, especially from an industrial perspective. Mm -hmm. So what we have that the other regions don't have are binational location. So companies can come and set up in Niagara but get access to the whole, you know, North American, Eastern North American market. Mm -hmm. So that's quite attractive. Um, our transportation infrastructure. So here we have access to highway, rail, and then close proximity to airports as well as the Welling Canal. Mm -hmm. So um, I, could, I will talk about some of those investments that are associated with that in a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and then our labor force. So uh, we have a strong manufacturing labor force as well as tourism oriented labor force. So when companies are coming here, that's th the biggest questions I get are, are about labor availability because you can't really operate a business without having skilled staff to support the business and to, to actually operate the business. So that's actually the, the biggest question, things around wage rates, how many people are you know, in the labor force in this industry or that occupation. So I deal with a lot of those types of questions when we're dealing with uh, you know, investors on larger projects. So this is interesting, good stuff. Um, I'm thinking about, as you're talking about that, because I born and raised Niagara, I love it here, run my business here. I think Niagara, is a great pocket. We're between the, the two Great Lakes. We're close to the border. We're a hop, skip, and a jump from GTA. We got agricultural. We have uh, like wineries. I, I think it's a phenomenal spot. And I'm, I'm just thinking to myself, okay, if there's business looking at different areas, um, the first thing I was thinking, like you said, prices. If somebody was, or a company was looking at Toronto, real estate there would be way more. Like you're talking cost of living, but if they wanted to, build a, a factory or I don't even know what kind of businesses we're talking about. It would be uh, exponentially more to do it out that way. Well, the issue right now, so um, we our office typically works with industrial manufacturing businesses. Okay. 
Um, and right now there's no space left in the GTA. Like the market is at our doorstep right now. Mm. And I can sit here and probably list dozens of different industrial projects that are, have been done or currently being done. Um, so the market is here. Um, but we also have like an attractive incentive, uh, mm. you know, offering to help offset some of those expansion or relocation costs. Um, so there is a lot of interest. A lot of the investment that's happening is from companies in the GTA. However, international is very strong right now. So um, as I mentioned, uh, very similar to what you have probably seen in the residential um, sector. Like mm -hmm. there's a lot of interest here from residential. We have the same level of interest from an industrial Interesting. That's awesome. That's great to hear that for Niagara as a whole. Because when we get those businesses, that's good for everybody. That's correct. And, and, and as I mentioned, we still do compete on uh, a cost of living, quality of life perspective. Like you talked about what it's like living here. I live here for the same reason. Mm -hmm. um, I spent a year in Toronto, but that was enough. I came back. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, businesses are interested in that whole quality of life aspect, too. So we're working on a real large project right now and a, a major part of that um attracting the company here is quality of life like they want to know you know wh what what's the housing cost like how, what's the cost to relocate like you know so we do get some of those questions now in the past i didn't get a whole lot of that but now it's actually a lot of companies are competing on that because they know they also have to attract employees mm -hmm. so they want to make sure we have those amenities for their employees um so they're asking these questions at like point blake at blank at this point right and would would a big competitor be just over the border there like buffalo area like well uh, not necessarily hmm. the, 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 we, there are quite a few companies in niagara that actually operate in niagara canada as well as buffalo niagara mm -hmm. new york mm -hmm. um but i don't we don't compete a whole lot with hmm. them um we really compete with other areas in southern ontario um, like your Kitchener Waterloo, your Hamilton, gotcha. your Windsor, you know, those um, other regions. Gotcha. But but to be honest, if there's a major investment in Hamilton, it benefits people in Niagara as well. Like uh, uh, the people who live here, you know, our labor force is like extra regional now, everywhere from mm -hmm. Toronto to Niagara. So even when I'm selling Niagara, I still sell the labor force of Southern Ontario because you know, a large portion of that is within driving distance of right. Niagara. Right. Makes sense. So we get the benefit from that as well. Yeah. So you can access that labor pool, but you can, you know, put your business here where it's more cost effective. There's more space. Um, there's talent availability, all that kind of stuff. And then you mentioned some incentives. What are, what are some of those that like did you or grants? You, you said there's um, well, um, the incentives that we work with, um, they're basically like tax oriented incentives. So it's not actually my my role, so I can't gotcha. speak very specifically about them. But in general, um, some companies can get um, like a, a a rebate on their industrial development charges. Mm. So that's one program. Um, there's also a tax increment grant. Uh, program. So if a company is locating here, they're investing in the property, increasing the value, they can get a grant to offset some of the upfront costs mm -hmm. because ultimately over a longer period of time, they'll be paying more property taxes. So that's how the municipality recoups it over a number of years. But there's some up upfront kind of tax relief that they can get. Interesting. Interesting. So then too, when you're talking about Niagara, excuse me, it's not like Wayne Fleet's on this map where, like, because we don't get a lot of stuff like that. Are we talking more Welland, Fort Erie, Niagara Falls? Where, where are the areas that we're talking about Welland? So the areas, so you're correct. The reason why it's difficult in Wayne Fleet is just you don't have industrial water, yeah. municipal water service. Yeah. So you, you can't really have an industrial operation here of that nature. Mm -hmm. um, um, St. Catharines ha has seen a lot of investment around um, the former, or the, sorry, the uh, Port Weller dry docks area. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole lot going around in terms of marine manufacturing, um, like Ontario Shipyards, formerly Heddle Shipyards is in there. And there's a whole bunch of other companies in that area. Um, Thorold uh, is well along the Welland Canal. So the former Dana property, the former mm -hmm. Resolute Paper, Georgia Pacific, all of that property is being redeveloped right now, uh, or actually, sorry, repurposed into new industrial applications 
applications. So are there dozens of companies and hundreds of employees moving into those, oh, nice. you know, older industrial areas and repurposing them for new clean manufacturing and industrial activity? Clean manufacturing. Clean. That's an important distinction yeah. because the companies we deal with aren't your, uh, you know, dirty old manufacturing. Like it's clean. It's green it's uh you know they really focus on it's next generation yeah uh, eh? manufacturing for sure. what, what would clean manufacturing like what well i could use a real good example there's a company called char technologies that's located in what is known as the thorold multimodal hub uh, and what they're doing they've developed a biochar like a technology um that allows uh like a company for like stelco for instance hamilton um, to use their biochar, so they're basically recycling um, like woody uh, uh, landfill, um, okay. so like organic landfill. They're turning it into a char, and then a company like Stelco is using that in their blast furnace mm. um, to make steel. But it's far more invent environmentally beneficial than old ways of doing it. So that's just like one company, a clean tech company that's in there. Um, but there's other examples. There's a uh, a battery recycling company in there that's really focused on the EV market. Um, yeah, different types of companies like that that are, fo you know, have an environmental um, kind of lens on their businesses. EV electric vehicle. That, right. Correct. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. All good. All good. That's another big opportunity as well. So uh, a couple of years ago, we launched our 10 year economic development strategy and EV is a major part of the focus of that strategy, electric vehicle. Mm -hmm. um, and it's because the investments are being made right now for the future and, you know, the whole future of automotive manufacturing. Um, it's happening now. Uh, and we we're seeing a lot of traction in Niagara as well. What What's some of the outlook on EVs then? Like, um, cause now they are becoming more popular in hybrids. I I've heard some stuff that, and I don't know if it's true by a certain date that the government's like hoping to have a lot of the vehicles be electric vehicles. Is that anything? Uh, correct. It's part of the impetus. So by 2035, I believe they won't be selling any new internal combustion engine vehicles. So, um, that's only a lot. Oh, oh actually, sorry. No, it means, uh, I, I'm sorry. Let me no problem. no problem. Um, there will be hybrids and electric okay. vehicles. So no, only um, ICE. Yeah, um, only vehicles. gas. Correct. Gas, diesel. Yeah. Interesting. And that's creating the market demand. And a lot of companies internationally recognize it's going to create a huge market demand. Um, so they're looking to invest here. A lot of big multinational companies looking for access to the North American market. And, and as I mentioned, Niagara is very strategically located for that. What... I think that sounds great. You know, what concerns me when I hear that about that a little bit is the infrastructure and the distribution of energy to make that happen. It's a huge challenge and it's a major point of conversation. Um, right. Um, so I'm not an expert in the electricity grid, yeah. that sort of thing. Um, um, but certainly it's um, on the radar it, yes and i think that could also be f more economic opportunity we'll need companies to build the infrastructure to develop the technology right. so it's part of the uh, economic opportunity i think over the long term right so with all of this it's a focus on growth right we're not talking about being stagnant or going backwards it's about growth and making niagara better through that and I'm guessing like a big part of this is the economic benefits and for the municipalities, a lot more taxes, right? So it, it sounds like it's good. And when, when you have businesses that come in, it, the job opportunities are great, but for the people in that community, if the municipality is generating more taxes, it takes off some of the pressure on the homeowners. Because like here in Waynefleet, that's one of our challenges is like, we don't have that. So when the costs of living and expenses go up, it gets bared onto the homeowners because there's no great ways to generate income down here. Yep, that's correct. Um, having that industrial tax base really helps. Like some of those larger facilities, you pay a substantial amount of taxes every For sure, year. it's big time. Yeah. Um, uh, I guess I, I can't say anything in particular, but I'm yeah. familiar with what they pay. And it's substantial. Yeah, for sure. For and, sure. And it does offset the cost of residential. And even if we, let's say we land a big industrial company, um, let's say somewhere in South Niagara, like outside of Waynefleet, 
Uh, it still benefits Wayne Fleet because they do pay regional taxes. Mm-hmm. You know, it it, it lifts the the, the um, it it lifts everybody. It's yeah. rising tide lifts all boats. Essentially, yeah, yeah so. for sure. Because uh, bo- I think it's half of our taxes go to the region. So if the region is benefiting from these things, it definitely in theory would help us out. Yeah, yeah. correct. And then uh, and then the employees that get uh, hired by these companies, mm-hmm. we hope they buy properties here and mm-hmm. pay property taxes. So, mm-hmm. you know, there's that huge ripple effect. Yeah. But the goal is essentially investment, jobs, generate more tax revenue. Yeah. Yeah, I I love it. You're you're within a department that I think is fantastic. Like owning a business, having a business background. I think like being in a government position, you're in a great department. Like I love it, like this stuff. It like excites me. And we haven't even got into some of the projects or anything, but I love hearing stuff like that that can help everybody. Like I'm not hearing. I'm sure there's people out there that can pick apart some negative things, but I'm not hearing any from what you guys are doing. I know there's some people that are like not in my backyard stuff, but like you're gonna have that wherever you are. But it's there's a lot of positive from the your guys department there. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a fun place to work right now because um, mm-hmm. it, we do have a lot of opportunity. So I, I started, the first time I worked at the region was 2008 to 2011 through the financial crisis and all of that fun Must stuff. Have been tough. And it was a very different environment back yeah, then. Eh? So now I'm keeping top of new investments. And, and back then I was triaging plant closures and helping, <sighs> you know, doing whatever we could to try and retain some of the laid off uh, skilled people and direct them into new companies. And, but it was real challenging back that then. That is challenging. Like compared to now, it's night and day. And that was 12, 14, 15, 16 years ago, something like that. Correct. And it was a completely different environment. That's wild. So now, what are some of the things that we can talk about? You touched on, and I remember, I don't know if you got some stuff there, but the, I looked at briefly at one point the economic plan for Niagara. It's a 10-year plan. Correct. Um, and I don't know if you want to talk about that or you got some notes here, which I think is great things that we can talk about. I don't know, projects coming up or forecasts. I, this <laughs> Now I, I kind of want to see... Uh, yeah, where you want to go with this because you're, you're definitely on the front line more of what's going on over there. Okay, so as mentioned, I'm really the data guy and my focus is on what's going on the uh, in the economy from like a data perspective. So my, my notes here really just um, include uh, some major indicators in mm-hmm. terms of, uh, you know, the region's economic performance. So oftentimes we hear like national stuff. Yeah, this is happening nationally or provincially. But my job really is to bring all of that information and provide it locally. Um, so what I have here is basically just an economic update. So I presented this at the Planning and Economic Development Committee um, just last week. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and I do it twice annually. Um, I also do it at the Niagara Economic Summit mm-hmm. uh, uh, that the GNC, Greater Niagara Chamber of Commerce puts on. And it, it's just a way to just inform people in terms of what's happening in the economy. So you're so, taking a look at some of the major indicators. Correct. So if you want, I can just give a, kind yeah. of a brief overview. I'd love to hear saying. it. Yeah. Okay. So, so I'll give you the real uh, kind of overview. So um, recently, the Conference Board of Canada um, reported that from tw- 2021 to 2022, um, Niagara's um, output growth rate, so GDP, mm-hmm. grew, about, grew by 5.5%. Wow. Um, and that was the second highest of all urban regions in, in the country. Wow. So of all census metropolitan areas. So um, when I'm saying, you know, you're seeing this activity, like it's reflected in the data. What year was that? Sorry. 2021 to 2022. Yeah, that was healthy growth. Yeah, that was coming out of the pandemic. There was a ton of growth. A lot of that was fueled by like manufacturing exports and the return of tourism. So, um, mm. so very strong year. Uh, this year, our growth rate, uh, like 2023, much lower um, because we're dealing with some other challenges associated with inflation. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're looking at maybe a 1.3% this year, maybe 1.5 in 2024. Still growth though. Still growth. 
yeah. not a recession. <laughs> right. So that's what, you know, that's what we're really, uh, really hoping for. And, and that's what we're seeing in the data. Is a recession a negative number? Is that what? Yeah, two quarters of negative growth, basically. So negative growth doesn't mean it has to be below zero. It could just mean going from 1.5 to 1.4 or 1.3? Um, essentially. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. And that could just be by 0.1? Oh, no, no, sorry. It would be, no, it would be... Um, uh, it would be less than zero. Okay, less than zero. Gotcha, yeah, like gotcha. negative growth. Zero gotcha, would gotcha. Be, yeah, like zero percent growth would be the same. Yeah. Negative growth, then you're looking at, you know, two quarters of negative growth. That's gotcha. a recession. So right now, even the country is basic. We don't know yet if there's a recession when we get the GDP figures. Um, then we'll, you know, but it's at the point where like, um, if there is. It's not a big at this point. Like it's not a massive challenge that we're seeing. Mm -hmm. um, but that being said, you know, there's people that struggle in the economy. Mm -hmm. um, there's we have other issues, affordability, homelessness. You know, mm -hmm. those sorts of things. Like a, a great economy doesn't solve all of that. Mm -hmm. um, so I always like to make that point that we had all this opportunity and we still have a ton of opportunity. Doesn't necessarily deal with those other challenges. But everyone, all the regions in Canada have those challenges. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I also I, I like to put that out there before I start start talking about you know the, the economy as a whole has done really well and yeah. I've got the proof here and and I'll just give you some other you, stats. even before you keep going. I appreciate this. I, the recession thing I find a little bit interesting, or even all of this, because to identify a recession takes a long period of time of collecting data, right? So it, it's. When I think about it, and please correct me if I'm wrong, like when a recession is identified, it by that time it's already been happening. Correct. Right. So that because there's a tail end to this because I'm I'm get I'm guessing that there's all these indicators of these different costs of things up or down and uh, expenses, but it's over a period of time. So it's it's funny that a recession could be announced, but we've been living it already for X amount of time. Like, do you know how long of a, a leg or a, a tail there is to try and identify? Maybe, I know there's two, did you say two quarters? Um, yeah, two, two consecutive quarters of negative growth would be, a, so six months. And then we wouldn't get that data until a few couple months after. Right, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. So and, it's, and another point, um, like the inflation uh, uh, data was announced today by Stat Statistics oh. Canada. So like uh, inflation right now is at 3.4%, but that was from December and they just reported that today. So, mm -hmm. um, so inflation has not come down. So that'll affect interest rates in the future um that indic you know that could signal that bank of canada may not reduce the rates because not yet we're dealing with the we're still dealing with the inflation challenge. what's the target three percent was it um like um generally it's two percent mm. so the faster we get to two percent the better you know if we started to get there quicker they could uh you know um uh, reduce the rates, but um, but they might have to raise it again to get to two. I don't think they'll raise it because it is being reflected in the uh, labor indicators, so it is softening up employment. It is make you know yeah. So it's we're at a real fine balancing act right now that they're that they have to do. It's been an interesting ride with all of everything lately, with interest going up so exponentially quickly, so in a sh short period of time. It's been crazy. I have never seen it like this dynamic month over month. Like I'm waiting for the data to get released so that it, I know what's going on. Because people will ask me, <laughs> I have to brief, you know, politicians and senior leadership. And, right. and I really don't know. It, usually it's things like housing prices, um, like labor indicators, uh, like retail sales, like that kind of stuff changes quickly when there's changes in the economy mm -hmm. like you'll see it quickly in the data but other indicators take longer right Things like i mentioned like uh, even like gdp inflation like that kind of stuff takes a little bit longer yeah yeah and one thing just to play off it too i started in real estate about 10 years ago 2013 i remember when i started talking with some of the seasoned vets that have been in the business like 30 years and talking about interest because there's as you know but people that are listening, there's a huge correlation between interest rates and real estate prices. Interest rates come down, prices go up, 
interest rates go up, prices can come down. And I remember talking to one of the seasoned vets because when I started, interest was, I think it was around three, maybe 4% around there when I started about 10 years ago. And one of the gentlemen was telling me that from what I remember that he hadn't seen the overnight rate change in the same direction two quarters in a row. And he'd been in business 30 years. So maybe it had happened, but it had been a long time. Yeah, th- like that was the first I've seen it. And I had a variable rate mortgage for a very long time, you know, and there was very little change in the interest rates. And um, so I never noticed it. But now it's like... It wow. was going up every month or whatever, something like twice. Like they were doing it more often than I thought was possible. Yeah, pretty much every time they had to, to review the policy interest rate, it was going up. But it's because inflation was out of control. Like we were over 7%, you know. Yeah, it's wild. Like the price of goods. And, and, and it's, you know, it's really a global issue. Um, supply chain, pandemic, all of the, It's like a Ukraine war. Like it was like a perfect storm for that to happen. Mm-hmm. And now it's just like getting us back to where we were. Mm-hmm. Like the economy is doing pretty well, like before the recession, without all of the inflation and that's not the recession, sorry, the pandemic. Yeah. Without all of the inflation and everything. And like the pandemic really pumped the economy in certain ways, but it also pumped the inflation. So it's it's, wild, eh? Yeah. Isn't it wild how everything works? Like finding balance is difficult. And like even like trying to get us to balance, they had to be so. Uh, I don't want to say reactive. I don't know what the r- right word is, but dr- uh, dramatic's not even it. It's just they had to like take extra measures to try and bring it down, which also causes volatility. So it's like, it's so wild. Yeah, like any kind of economic downturn right now is like self-inflicted. Yeah. You know, they just, it was too hot. Yeah, And we see it every day in Niagara. It's just uh, like in terms of the activity and, well, yeah, okay, you continue with this <laughs> stuff. Yeah, sorry, that so, was a good little oh, no, side tangent. Worries. No worries, we, we talked a lot about um, a lot about the different uh, indicators that I have here, but yeah. um, some other things that I would just like to mention, like overall salaries and wages have been lower in like Niagara compared to Ontario for as long as I can remember. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and we're still lower, but we're catching up. So that's a really good sign. And this is employment income in Niagara. So that's another positive sign. So although there's inflation, mm-hmm. there is wage growth as well. Um, so <laughs> if there wasn't, then we'd be in really big trouble. But uh, right. But that's a positive. Right. Um, um, like the housing prices, I'm sure you're aware, are mm-hmm. creeping down now. So at the peak, they were at about, what, 791000 benchmark Average price, price in Niagara. Yeah. yeah. And now what we're at like about, what, 640000 So um, it's yeah. very dynamic, yeah. too. Like it changes every time they release the data. So I watch that as well. Yeah. I, I'll spend a little bit of time on that before you flip through it to talk about that because it has been a wild ride with the real estate prices because, yeah, even before the pandemic, when interest rates got below 2%, that's when we started seeing prices really going up. And like with Niagara specifically, when that happened, we started to see a big influx coming in from GTA. Like I remember when I started 10 years ago, it was rare around the office that somebody would talk about a GTA buyer. It would not that it was never, but it was seldom. And then all of a sudden, like people started coming to Niagara. And I've said since like after a year or two of that happening, that the floodgates were open because a lot of people that I've dealt with from GTA, they love it here. Like Niagara is this fantastic place. And then when they love it, they start telling family and friends and like they're coming. I still find that the majority of our buyers are domestic from Niagara, people buying and selling. But it it seems like that number of GTA people has gone up. And I, I haven't monitored it recently, to be honest, but people of GTA are well aware of what's going on in Niagara here. That's great. Um, and I agree with you. I can't really talk about from like a buyer's perspective, but in mm-hmm. terms of like in migration, mm-hmm. um, during the pandemic, we brought in like a net 14,000 people from Toronto and Hamilton that moved to Niagara. So, you know, mm-hmm. it supports your, mm-hmm. your point that, um, it's not going to pace ni- people from Niagara buying stuff here, mm-hmm. but it's a mm-hmm. substantial market. You what know? did you, what was that term? I am, 
immigration or did you just say oh, in migration in so, migration yeah uh-huh. so i have we can get data on like who's coming to niagara what's the age demographic that sort of thing so i i got another interesting stat out of the fourteen thousand during the pandemic period um the biggest demographic were ages zero to four and 35 to 45. So essentially young families, they were they accounted for like almost half of all the the in migrants here to Niagara. Interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, so it really supports your yeah. uh, your point that a lot of GTA people, a lot of families from the GTA. Mm-hmm. Um so, you know, that that's great for us. So. Yeah. And it was interesting you talking about uh, average house price because when I look at it, it's, it's refreshing hearing the actual number because I look at it in percentages because house prices pre-pandemic pandemic, they like doubled twice. It was insanity where I'm sure you know this, but before the craziness and like when I started, like national real estate appreciation was about 3% a year, which I don't know if that's good, bad or not. But then when you're seeing it double in a couple of years, you're talking like that 3% or more in a month. Like we've seen, I think months that I think are like six, seven, eight percent in a month. There was people that were buying a house and before getting the keys, their house was worth like 20, 30 grand more or maybe more. And like, it was insanity. Like, cause when I started, people were selling their houses. They had owned it for five years well, no, I shouldn't say five years, a couple years. And they'd be losing money because they had to pay 5 6% on commission. And here they're at a different time. Like you're talking 20, 2008 to 2024, how much different. It's so wild. It is wild. Wild. So I went, um, just anecdotally, when I bought my house in 2007, like interest rates are much higher than two. Like I paid over 6% on my mortgage. But as you, like you said, um, the actual house is a fraction of what it would go for today. Fraction, fraction. Yeah. yeah. And so, and then continuing on, seeing the prices like double, I'm sure your numbers are pretty close, but we've seen from uh, February, March, uh, a couple of years ago, I think it's two years ago now, when we hit the peak of the prices, that they came down about 30% over the course of a year and change, which was a wild back down it's not like they (laughs) corrected back down to where they were before but like that's volatile waters we were in for years like i can't tell you how many times i was walking into houses when the market was on fire and being like i can't believe this house is like listed for this much it was like two weeks ago a house sold up the street that was nicer that nicer than this for less and like now it, it was just so wild like I would be, you know, it would be hard to make wise financial decisions when things are so dynamic and moving and changing like month over month, yeah. you know, and it's like that right now. And, um, it's just, we don't know what's going to happen next mm-hmm. month, what the data is going to show us where we have come over the last couple of months and from a data perspective. So it is, we're, we're like, I've never seen it like this. As I <laughs> mentioned, we do live in a very, very interesting time. Yeah, it is very interesting. And what, what I'm hoping for is stability because with stability it makes it like you said before it's hard when it's so wild to make decisions but when it becomes stable it becomes easier and even when i started in real estate because i'm helping people make big financial decisions right i'm coaching them along but when i started it was stable and but i would always tell people too like it, you know the interest has been like this for however long the real estate market has been like this for however long but any day and this is like, you're in economics. We can wake up tomorrow and the government makes some type of announcement and things change. Like that can happen at any time, even in a stable market, let alone a volatile one. Like that's, it just, it, that's what happens. Yeah. Like, I don't think, that, you know, the government doesn't like to make um, real quick decisions like that. You know, they understand sometimes it's necessary, like what we saw through the pandemic and, Mm -hmm. you know, the bank of Canada, the government actually doesn't like control their interest rate changes and that sort of thing. So, Mm -hmm. um, um, but uh, any, anyway, Mm -hmm. it's, you know, you're right. Things can change. Mm -hmm. Um, and overnight overnight yeah like, they can even if they're getting talked about because like things get talked about then some but something comes out that changes what we thought 
right? So you yeah, could be yeah, like, for sure. like this morning, um, the inflation rate at 3.4%. Well, that changes how I'm thinking about stuff. That one announcement, all of a sudden, because before I was thinking, well, an interest rate cut could be in the cards for second quarter of 2024. Mm -hmm. Now that announcement this morning, inflation has gone up by 0.3%. Now I'm like, well, maybe there won't be an interest rate cut. Maybe mm -hmm. that's not in the cards for uh, mm -hmm. quarter, second mm -hmm. quarter, you know? Mm -hmm. So <laughs> perfect which, example. Which I think is okay. I think I think stability is good as long if it goes up it's I think going to have more of a negative effect than not but I don't know I don't know combating inflation how important that is to everything else cuz like you said we're we're at this balancing point where it's 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 getting uh Fragile. Yes, yes. And the Bank of Canada, they don't want to hurt our economy. They're doing this to sustain our economy, right. you know? Right. Because if we just went cr crazy and, and didn't adjust the interest rates, inflation would be through the roof and we would eventually, the economy wouldn't collapse. Yeah. Like you cannot sustain that. So this is all about sustaining it over a longer period. Imagine being the ones that's trying to balance that, how hard that is. Yeah, like their job is like that one little interest rate, but there's a lot of people doing a lot of research and analysis and, you know, there's a lot of people um, and a lot of work going behind those decisions. But the decision is just that one little decision, <laughs> but it affects millions of people, you know, and it affects the future of our country. So, yeah, yeah, um, yeah I know like our focus is Niagara, but that stuff affects everybody. Totally. Totally, totally. Okay, I'll, I'll let you keep. Um, I like our little side tangents. But, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I just wanted to just mention. So I got some data here just on investment and construction. So in residential, so uh, that's remained consistent. So despite all this stuff, oh yeah, we're still seeing a good amount of uh, like investment in building construction from a residential point of view. Hmm. Haven't lost much activity there. Interesting. Um, we've seen a, a minor de um, decrease in uh, building permits. Um, but uh, just minor, minor, like last year was big. And then this year is a small decline, but st still a lot more than, you know, 21, 20, 2019, you know, right. So there's still it's still in a positive um, place from a data Int point of view. Yeah, that's interesting, because from what I've seen, new construction has been like tough. And I, that's something that we don't do a lot of. I have uh, one realtor that works with me that puts a lot of effort into that and focus but um yeah new construction has been slowed down quite a bit so it's interesting to hear that it, the data doesn't completely show that well and, and if it's slowing down right now the data yeah you know the it's data delayed. it's yeah, delayed yeah the delayed yeah we're talking about data that was released you know um before uh yeah. Three months before the end of the year. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, 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 yeah. You yeah, know, yeah. that's one challenge with doing this stuff too. It's just that delayed data. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. delayed. Like I said, we're we're living and we'll be learn we'll learn about what we're doing now <laughs> a couple <laughs> months from now. So. Yeah. See, and just to comment on that too, I'll, I'll relate that to me just to give you a little perspective from my life too, because being realtors on the front line of real estate. We're, I call it the battlefield. We're right on the front line, uh, experiencing with buyers and sellers, experiencing the current real estate market. But there's a delay with that f for us too when it gets out. And the, the way that works is like we're seeing it day in and day out because we're here, there's only a few of us and we're pretty busy. So we're like experiencing, it's not like we're just doing a little bit of business here and there. And we have to translate that to our buyers and sellers because they're always working off of old data themselves because their friend sold a house up the street three, six months ago for this price or sold this quickly or whatever. And we're talking to them about what's happening now. So there's a, there's a lag of a, a couple of few months of educating buyers and sellers because even when you're telling them, they're, they're not realizing it until a little bit of time that passes on. And then continuing on with that, when it reaches the media, it's already like almost old news. So it's, I'm, I don't want to say that with everything with real estate because like some of the stats like make sense, but the market could be like so much different because it's, it just takes time to get there, right? Because the people in the media aren't the ones on the front line. Even if they have people on the front line, it's still... Yeah, you just don't, you cannot replace that front line experience. And that's no. in my 
perspective, from my perspective, that's just as important as the data mm -hmm. because you can use the data to kind of support or not, you know, some of the opinions you may have um, from doing frontline. But frontline, like, uh, that's why I said, you know, housing prices are a really quick indicator because they're really, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. you would even learn even quicker than that by talking to people on the front line, yeah, you know, exactly. and you would get some opinions and some insight in terms of what they're experiencing. Oh, if they're experiencing this, then many other people are, you know, and then, and then that eventually gets reflected in the data a few exactly. months later. Exactly. So yeah, when, if you're ever, looking for any feedback or frontline information in real estate, by all means, you, you have my contact information. I'm more than happy to give insight into that to help support what you've got there. But Yeah, sounds good. Maybe in a future uh, podcast, we can maybe talk more about the real estate side of things. Yeah. And, you know, and I could kind of pepper in some other data points or, or what yeah. have you. So. Yeah, that sounds good. I like that idea. Oh, I guess I'll continue on. Um, so from a, um, a non-residential perspective, so mm -hmm. industrial, commercial, and then government institutional, um, we've seen like major, major decline in commercial. Um, so before COVID, a, a lot of commercial development here. Mm -hmm. But after COVID, not so much. We pretty much have zero office projects on the books right now. Um, and it's a lot of it has to do with what happened to the whole workplace culture around COVID with the hybrid working situations, work at home, mm -hmm. that, that stuff. So I think it is a combination of that mm -hmm. and that Niagara is well served from a retail perspective. So mm -hmm. I have talked with other real estate agents that say, yeah, you know, Niagara is a lot of retail at this point. Um, mm -hmm. We're also growing fast. So you need that retail to support our growing population. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. but at this particular time, we're not seeing a lot of growth in commercial. Um, and then, you know, um, and, and same with government, basically it's, it stays relatively consistent, but, but not any growth, um, where we do see a lot of the growth, as I mentioned, is around industrial. Hmm. Very, very interesting. Um, is that the last year notes? There? Um, oh. I do have a few more, uh, other things I can mention. So international trade is big here. So Niagara is one of the few regions in Canada that mm -hmm. is a net exporter of goods. About 90% of the value of those goods are from manufacturing sector. Um, and, and throughout the pandemic, so before the pandemic, our exports were valued at about $4.7 billion. Oh, wow. Um, from Niagara? From Niagara. Holy. By 2022, they were valued at $8.2 billion. So... It goes to show you, you know, have I mentioned or you've heard about supply chain issues like it, we've all heard about this stuff, but it was actually an opportunity for a lot of Niagara businesses because they are supplying products from here. Um, so it created a huge market opportunity internationally. And it appears right now that we're sustaining that. So we we were lucky that we were able to supply these markets. And now it looks like, you know, we're sustaining those customers. So. Um, that shows up in the data very, very positive. Wow. Do you do you have the data on what, uh, like some of the top exports from that eight point? Oh, okay. Well, I, I have it not with me right now, but yeah. I, I, I'm familiar with it. And predominantly like um, fabricated metal products manufacturing. So like machinery, mm. um, um, transportation equipment, um, you know, plastic and rubber is another one. Chemicals are another big one. Um, chemicals, eh? Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, quite a few large chemical processing companies here. Huh. Everything from like food additives to um, mm. like uh, lubricants to, you know, all different types of chemicals. Mm. So. Yeah, we got uh, Young Buns Hour just around the corner from here. They do citric acid over there. Yeah, and that's what it, when I mentioned food additives, that's they yeah. make a food additive. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's an example of a chemical manufacturer. Yeah, so. yeah, interesting. Um, but there's other like big ones and well-established ones, Mancuso, Cytec, uh, you know, you could go on. Hmm. But uh um, but but a lot of those companies, those are exporters. Like Young Buns are like they're a major exporting company. Mm -hmm. So you know, so the data, all this stuff shows up in there, and those are all the companies that are getting uh, new market opportunities. Right. Um. Um, uh, another thing I was going to mention, or just business counts, so new business creation. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the, typically, the way we track these businesses are businesses that don't have employees and businesses with employees. So like self-employed people would show up under businesses without employees. 
Um, so those have grown consistently over the last four years. Um, so let's like in 2020, we had about 27,600 as of 2023, we had 30,415. Hmm. So those are your businesses without employees, um, businesses with employees. So we're at about 14,000 right now. There is a period during 2021 where there was a decline of about 400 businesses, but that was all pandemic related. So, so they, yeah, like they, those uh, businesses that were laid off their employees mm -hmm. would have uh, not showed up in that data. But as soon as they brought the employees back, then they showed up and, and we actually gained more than we lost over the, over the whole, you know, period of time. Gotcha. Is unemployment uh, indicator like how did you got that in there? Or yeah. To, yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, the last part of like my economic update is all those labor oriented indicators. Okay. Interesting. So I guess I can mention um, like our labor force grew a lot during the pandemic. A lot of that is associated with just our population growth in general. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people who moved here were already employed, already participating in the labor force. So that helped uh, it helped improve our stats. Mm -hmm. but, but, but we've also gained, you know, uh, a lot of people internally in Niagara. Mm -hmm. um, so like at the height of the pandemic, our labor force is about 216,000 um, people. Oh yeah, and there's like 450, so almost half of the region employed. Um, well, right now the labor force is 243,000, so 240. it just shows you how much it grew over wow. that period. Uh, our population in Niagara now is about 500,000. Oh, so we're at five. We, we've surpassed the 500,000 mark in nice. 2023. Nice, so, nice, nice. Yeah, so we're about 501,000. Last time I I checked. Yeah. So. Um, uh, employment. So during the pandemic, uh, like our employment dropped to as low as 189,000. Um, I'll just tell you what we're currently at. You got a lot of data there, eh? Data man, I like it. <laughs> we're currently at about 230,000 people employed. So, you know, we're much better off now than we were even before the pandemic from an employment perspective. In the economic plan or just from yourself, do you have forecasts on the population of Niagara over a period of time, we're going to continue to see growth, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Um, so actually through the official plan process at Niagara Region, they did the population and housing forecast. So we have all of that data. Um, some of it is in the strategy, um, but, but the strategy really focuses more on like a sector, industrial opportunities, like some of the more that kind of stuff. Um, and then planning really focuses on population growth, house, housing growth, like managing that, that type of growth as well. So, um, um, uh, but we do have those forecasts and that sort of thing. Interesting. And just to pull it back to Wayne Fleet here, it's funny because as far as I know, we still have a 0% per percent growth for population Popu <laughs> or housing, I should say. Oh, housing. Yeah. 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 yeah which population like, cause in Wayne fleet, the population is basically unchanged since I've been here. It's been, it's hovered around 6,000 for a number of years, 6,000 to 6,500 in there. Yeah. yeah I think yeah. there's like real moderate growth. Um, yeah. Very. Yeah. But, but again, it, then Wayne fleet keeps its character too, you know, totally. part of it characters, the rural charm, you know, uh, it's mm -hmm. a great place to be. Like, mm -hmm. uh, I love coming up to Wayne Fleet. Yeah. So, you know, if they changed things, it wouldn't be the same Wayne Fleet. No, it definitely wouldn't. But it, it's interesting because there's some people that are say that about keeping the charm, keeping Wayne Fleet the way it is. But it's interesting because that gets threatened by what all these things we're talking about. Because at some point, where's left to grow? At some point, might not be in our lifetime, but at some point, Wayne Fleet might be threatened with putting in septics and and or not septic sewers right. and water at some point because if we run out of room then what's next i don't know i don't know mid do they continue to protect agriculture or not i'm not sure but it's a threat it's certainly a threat um, yeah encroachment on agriculture you know it's always it's it's it will always be like an issue that mm -hmm. it's good to be concerned and, and to monitor mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Right, like uh, like I mentioned, I don't see since Wayne Fleet doesn't have that infrastructure, I, I don't see like big subdivisions popping up here or no. you know, industri- big industrial operations, no. big commercial malls, anything like that. So N- not until the space is run out and then yeah, they yeah, determine. Uh, yeah, which yeah, is a long sure. time away. Yeah. Yeah. Still we we saw quite a bit of space in Niagara. Like we can meet all those provincial housing targets. You know, with the existing space in Niagara. Right, right. Because, yeah, they're predicting quite a bit, right, with immigration and everything. Um, yeah, like, uh, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but yeah, you would okay. be surprised. Maybe next time we can talk about housing and population mm-hmm. forecasts mm-hmm. because uh, there's some surprising numbers from a growth perspective, like over the next 20, 30 years. Or so. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So now can we dig into a little bit, I'm not sure if it's confidential or not, but some of the specific companies that are either on the books of coming or have maybe recently come that maybe we start with recently that maybe... Yeah, I can. Uh, the only thing I can talk about is stuff that's been made public already. Okay, yeah, So we perfect. talked a little bit about electric vehicles, so I'll mention that one, and it's uh, not too far from here, actually. The uh, Linamar plant in Welland, so it's going to be a giga casting factory. They're going to be making the chassis for electric vehicles there. Hmm. So that's a major investment, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of square feet, hundreds of jobs, uh, many millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars. So that's in Welland. Um, um, it's actually an old brownfield that's been redeveloped, and now the company will be there. So Linamar has their headquarters in Guelph. They're a really mm-hmm. well-established uh, high-tech uh, automotive manufacturing company in Niagara. I mean, not Niagara. I mean, in Canada and yeah. Ontario. So, yeah. so having them come to Niagara is very, very positive, especially because electric vehicles are a major focus. So the city of Welland... Um, has done a real good job to like getting their sites um, investment ready and working with these companies. So, you know, um, uh, so they did an excellent job landing that particular right. one. Um, so that's one good example. Another good example is a company called Siltec in Fort Erie. Um, so they're a chemical manufacturing company. Um, that investment is over a hundred million dollars, wow. I believe. Um, and they make polymer additives um, for other chemicals. Um, they're a company from the GTA, and they needed to expand, so they actually chose a site in Fort Erie. So we worked with the province of Ontario and the town of Fort Erie to make that happen. Um, so that's a major investment, and and uh, um, it's being uh, developed right now, the site. Mm-hmm. And there's that's a, awesome. There's another expansion in Fort Erie called Abatement Technologies. So th- they've been a uh, like a long time community member in Fort Erie, um, but they decided to expand and make their like headquarters in Fort Erie. Oh, so, nice! So when you're on the QEW going towards the bridge, you'll see abatement technologies bring new building. Like you'll see a few new buildings in that area, and those are um, uh, either new companies coming or it's the uh, existing companies that are expanding here. Hmm. Wild. Yeah. So um, lots of other ones. Um, what else should I mention? Um, the, the just while you're thinking the ones that come to my mind that are not so new now like those well even before i go there the one in welland is they have they broke ground oh uh, at linamar yeah yes they're moving fast on that one. okay nice and the things i think of when with this is i know it's not now but it was over on the 140 the ge plant ge yes now Enio bought that plant and they're operating it now so very high-tech manufacturing facility clean manufacturing yeah i've so, heard that about them that's super yeah, clean over there like it, it's probably the cleanest site you'd ever see if you you know go inside very interesting um but that's one a good example um uh, you know that was i believe around t- t- 2016 when that one happened but that was the start Um, or a catalyst for a lot of this other development. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, like that was one of the first big anchor, big big ones in the area, and now we're seeing a lot more of that happening. Right. Um, And then one not too far up the street, I forget what it is, but they do like protein bars or whatever. Oh, that is Northern Gold Foods. Yes. So they make like cereal bar products, that sort of thing. So that happened soon after... Uh, the GE, GE investment, yeah. yes. And then even not too far from there is the hydroponic lettuce place. Oh, yeah, Vision Greens. They're a major success story in Welland as well, so they're doing incredibly well. Um, that was another one that we worked with the city of Welland on. Um, 
uh, to land that one and that's they do um vertical f- farming inside like a, an industrial facility but again it's clean when i say industrial it's yeah it's food grade you know like you can yeah. uh, they, they sell that to grocery stores and that so um these are you know real advanced manufacturing i still remember the day that i was shopping at pupo's grocery in welland and it was winter time and i walked through and i seen some lettuce and it said local produce or local lettuce I pick it up and it's Welland. And I'm like, what the <laughs> heck? I'm like, where are they growing lettuce in February? And yeah, like that, uh, I, I literally went from there to drive to where it was. And I'm like, this is a lettuce place? But yeah, because it looks industrial, but yeah. Yeah, it's... Uh, I was actually at Big Red meat, or Big Red um, grocery store in Thorold, and I saw the lettuce there as well just recently. Right so on. It's great to see that their products are in the local yeah. stores. Cause yeah, yeah. Yeah, Pupo's is another one of those like local grocery mm-hmm. stores. My mom actually worked there in the '60s. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No way. That's yeah, awesome. She was friends with the family there. So. No way. Yeah, that's a classic, classic place there. Yeah, we still do shop in there. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah, I guess one other thing I, I, I can mention the unemployment rate as well. We were kind of talking a little bit about different labor indicators. So, um, coming out of the labor force, like our uh, the labor force coming out of the pandemic our labor force um, dropped to like the lowest I've ever seen it. It was around like 4.8% around there. Um, And then just recently it's been going up because there are like our labor force is growing faster than employment. Mm -hmm. So there's more people looking for work than, um, um, how do I explain this? So the Mm -hmm. labor force are all those people that either are working or they're looking for work and then employment um, are those people that have work and then the difference would be the unemployment rate. So, mm-hmm. um, um, so again, uh, during the uh, coming out of the pandemic, we we're at like 4.8%, like very low, lower than the province, lower than the country. Um, but now we're at about 6.1% and it just went up again to about, I think 6.5% last month. Mm-hmm. Um, however, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, it just shows me that there is some slowing in the economy. Um, so the unemployment rate has gone up a little bit. Right. However, when we're working with companies that want to invest, um, they want to ensure that there's available labor here. So it actually helps us um, when we're selling their agent to say there is available labor here. Mm-hmm. Um, so the unemployment rate, a, a healthy unemployment rate is about around 6%. So, yeah. Eh? Yeah. So we're, it's still at a, at a good rate at this point and, and no real alarms. But again, we're watching it month over month. I've heard before, I don't know how you feel about this one, I don't even know if it's true or not, but that there is a correlation between inflation and the printing of money. Is uh, Do you know anything about this? There is. Um, or borrowing. Of, I don't like to use the term printing of money. Yeah, Let's I, just say borrowing of money. Yeah, and, that's um, the wrong term. Yeah, yeah, or like, I was trying to think of the right it, one. You know, the more money you borrow, it, it essentially gets deflated um but you're also putting it out in the economy um which is driving up inflation so uh, part of the reason why the inflation went up so high is that like during covid we had programs like cerb um and a lot of people received that money and when you look at income during that period the income levels of niagara actually went up substantially it's because a lot of people who are getting cerb like never made that amount of money previously Mm -hmm. so what happened was they have all this money they start spending it uh, it's you know it starts inflating the price of goods there's more demand for goods in the economy so Mm -hmm. when you do borrow money put money out there spend money um, it, it does tend to have that effect. Um, it's such it, a tricky thing to balance. It is. Is it the reason why we have this inflation rate? Um, not the only reason, maybe one of many reasons that are, you know, like it's like a perfect storm, as I mentioned. Yeah, it seems like that's not a popular topic amongst some of the government and politicians that there's a correlation between that. It seems like it's it, it's something that I hear every once in a while, and I'm not... An economist to be able to decipher it. it there's sense that makes it that comes from it but uh, yeah like there's so many variables where, where this is not a vacuum right like there's so many moving parts to it well and if you look at the data too and the fact that the dis- 
the discretionary income went up. Well, well, discretionary income is that money you have after, you know, you, you've paid all of your taxes mm-hmm. and all your, you know, main cost of living and the money you have left to spend. So when that goes up and, and people start spending it, um, there's more demand for goods. The price of goods starts to go up. You know, it's like a major ripple effect. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, I have some fun questions that are not uh, economic to follow up to end this, but is there any other stuff that you want to touch on? We, you've, you know your stuff. <laughs> I try. I try. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Is there any other things that you want to touch on before just changing gears a little bit to some fun stuff? Um, I guess the main takeaway is that, as we mentioned, we're watching it every month. Um, we're not in a bad place right now. Um, however, every you know we have to watch it and you have to see and. And, and as soon as we start see any challenges, you know, people get notified. We start thinking about, okay, what do we need to do from a policy perspective to help kind of, um, you know, uh, generate investment in this particular climate in Niagara. Mm-hmm. So, um, so let's just uh, hope that um, we continue to have some stability. Right. Uh, maybe the last thing I want to bring up with that too, <clears throat> with everything is you mentioned one of the things that the department does is marketing of Niagara. And I, I try to think like, what, what are, because I do a ton of marketing. So when I think of it, to me, it would almost be more PR of like building relationships with some of the big guys. But is there like, what, what's some of the, what is the strategy from that point? I know that's not your department, but. No, but I can talk about it. You mentioned PR and relationships like advocacy and government relations is a big part of it. So being there with the federal, provincial government, being on their radar, because there's federal and provincial groups like Invest Ontario or, mm-hmm. um, you know, um, uh, Invest Canada, for instance, uh, um, and and they deal with a lot of these opportunities. Like they're the first point of contact for a lot of these companies. So it's important to have those relationships mm-hmm. so that when they think about, you know, who can help make this happen, they think about Niagara. They come to us and say, hey, guys, do you have any sites? Can you facilitate this? You know, so we want to be top of mind for at those levels of government. Um, so that's more advocacy than marketing. From a marketing perspective, um, our stuff is like highly targeted. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, if there's a trade show in Germany around electric vehicles, like we'll do some geofencing, we'll put some resources into marketing it and elevating our brand for a trade show. Um, mm-hmm. and, and this is just, I'm just saying, for example, you yeah, know, yeah. Um, that has been done. Um, uh, just promoting Niagara through our website, our key sectors, um, you know, uh, the benefits of locating in Niagara, the benefits the quality of life here so you know from uh we do a lot of that kind of stuff but a lot of it is very specific and and targeted um to our key sectors and things that we're trying to to accomplish from an investment point of view gotcha how big is the economic department how many people work in there Uh, there's nine of us in economic development so what what's the like positions in there i'm guessing for sure marketing or whatever your data um yeah so it's um so we have a director we have an associate director so that's our leadership and they deal with you know big stuff regional council um you know administration of of all of our programs that sort of thing uh, there's me who does research. There's Eric Chow, and he does the manager of uh, investment and trade. So he deals with the investors when they're coming, um, international investors. That's a fun job, too. He's got a real interesting job. <laughs> it's a very sales-oriented job, so it'd be kind of similar to the type of job that you would do, but he's really yeah. focused on you know selling Niagara. Yeah. And then a lot of the marketing supports Eric. You know, But that said, like our uh, we have a... Uh, manager of strategic marketing, that's Kate, Katie Deharnay. Um, we have a uh, manager of strategic growth services, Dan Turner. So he does all of the grants and incentives, a lot of the policy around that and helps kind of expedite uh, developments that we're working with mm-hmm. um, just to help them navigate through the planning, the uh, regulations, all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, so he does that. Um, I think those are all the managers. We have an EDO, an economic development officer who's responsible for kind of uh, like tourism, agriculture, agri-food, agribusiness, um, and as well as supporting the rural municipalities that don't have economic development offices. Mm-hmm. Um, 
so if they need support we have like staff and resources to provide some support um who else is there uh we have another marketing staff um rob fuchilli who supports katie and marketing so nice. i think that was everybody that's pretty close yeah, yeah it gives a good close. landscape yeah, yeah just to give you an idea in terms of the positions that are there Okay. Good stuff. Good stuff. Yeah. I have some fun stuff, just personal, lighthearted questions. Well, some, but you, you ready to transition to those ones? Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. And th this is fun stuff. If, I hope you never are, but if you were ever on death row, what would your last meal be? Oh, <laughs> I know. You'll probably like this one. Pizza for sure. Really? Yeah. Oh, I like it. Yeah. What, what, from where and what would you want on it? Do you know what? Um, I really like Volcanoes pizza. Volcanoes is great. Yeah. And I would probably get ground beef, onions, and mushrooms. Solid. Solid. That's a good one. Um, anything else? Um, I like that you picked pizza though. That's sweet. Is yeah. that is that actually or just because? No, I, well, I, I do love pizza. You can't go wrong with pizza. So I'm like, yeah, I could probably get a full one of those pizzas on death row. What would you wa What would you wash it down with? Oh, probably Grolsch beer. That's for sure. Grolsch, nice, yeah. nice. And wrap it up with a dessert or? I'm not a dessert guy. More savory than sweet. Yeah, I would do maybe another pizza. <laughs> <laughs> I like your style. A Hawaiian pizza. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. I like it. Um, well, it's funny because my second question is, what do you like on your pizza? But you answered that. What about favorite kind of music or era of music? Um, favorite music, I'd have to say punk rock music. Um, anywhere from the 70s to current. So I, uh, you know, follow that. But, but again, I like all different kinds of music. But punk music... What some what are some bands for punk music? Um, what's my favorite band? Like right now, I like Hot Water Music quite a bit. It's one of my favorite bands. Um, and a band from the '80s called Bad Brains, I like quite a bit. Um, uh, it's hard. There's so many. There's hundreds yeah. of them. So. Yeah, all good. Um, if you could travel anywhere, where would you go? Hmm. <laughs> anywhere at this point, I wanted to go to Torngat Mountains and. Uh, Labrador so it's actually I believe it's in the Arctic but it's in Labrador Newfoundland Labrador interesting um, and it's on the north side it's like a very uh, remote mountainous area with polar bears they do a lot of gu like guided trips out there interesting but, but they're very expensive but uh, it is if you look at pictures of the Torngat Mountains like T-O-R-N-G-A-T um, it's very very cool area that I don't think a lot of people have heard about no I've never heard of that ever and it's in uh, Newfoundland and Labrador, which is cool. Yeah, interesting. I've been out to Newfoundland one time, but I haven't heard of that. Yeah, it was, it's like on the mainland and then like in the north part. Like it's pretty much the Arctic by that point. Hmm. I got uh, a couple a little more serious ones, but th these get a little fun too. What do you think the meaning of life is? Um, to have as many fun experiences as you can without harming or doing anything negative to other people. That's a solid, solid answer. I like that. Um, be, best piece of advice you could give anyone. Don't worry about things you can't control on your own. So you can only control certain things and those are the things that you should spend time being concerned about if you can't control it. Don't worry about it. That's great advice and sometimes very hard for people to... <laughs> very. I got to tell myself that all the time, so... Yeah, uh, very good one. Um, who played a big role in who you are today? Um, certainly my parents, uh, just because um, they were great. They're around a lot. We, we talk. We did speak a lot. We currently speak a lot, and they're very good at... Just kind of guiding me when I was growing up. So nice. I know it's a pretty lame answer. No, that's not lame at all. You know, but that's who comes to the mind first. They've that's, always been pretty good. That's and, not lame. That's very admirable. And I think I get that answer from a lot of people. Good good people tend to have that answer for their parents. Thanks. So, I appreciate that. Yeah, it's a good one. Uh, a couple more. Um, what do you want to be remembered for? Um... Being kind and, um, what's the word, um, like selfless, you know, I like to help people. 
Um, so that's it. Just being kind and selfless. That's good. You got good answers. You're a good guy, eh? <laughs> I try to be <laughs> sometimes. Um, last question. If you won a billion dollars, what would you do? A billion. Mm. A billion. Because, like, I mean, if you say a million, it's like, and then 10. Yeah, a, like a billion bil- is, like, you know, transformational. So um, I would have to find some kind of philanthropic pursuit, you know. Uh, actually, my dad and I had this conversation. If we could deal with homelessness in a particular area, you know, commit a certain amount of money to actually house people and provide resources, you know, maybe I would do something like that in Niagara. Um, you I know, like so, it. so that that would be part of it. The other part would be probably uh, get a cottage on like Lake Tomogamy up north because nice. they're pretty expensive now. You have to essentially buy the island, and you know. But that's one of my favorite spots. So um, even with a billion dollars, that's where I would choose to go. I like it. That's a good one. And homelessness, that's a good one too. Because homelessness, that's such a hard topic on how to fix that. I I mean, I've thought about it a few times soon. I don't know. That's a tough one. That's so yeah, tough. I think, you know, a lot of people in Niagara, um, you know, a lot of us think about this. You see it in the streets. You notice that it's gotten worse over the mm-hmm. last number of years. So I really just... You know, I would just wish that people would have the support so, you know, they wouldn't suffer that way. So, yeah. Yeah. Blake, this was fantastic. Yeah. It was a great pleasure. I'm very happy I came out. Yeah. Thank you for coming down to Wayne Fleet, joining me. This was great. I really appreciate it. My hey, pleasure. Thank Anytime. you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.